markets today. They are ending the day in red because the Fed is keeping Wall Street guessing about when we could see an end to these big interest rate hikes that make it a little more expensive for you to buy a new car or to get a mortgage. There's no slowdown coming today, with the central bank announcing a new three-quarters of a point jump, which brings us to the highest rate overall, nearly 4%, since Flo Rida and T-Pain got low on top of the charts, January 2008. Okay, Now Fed Chair Jerome Powell says they could slow down the rate hikes, but maybe not in December. Why not? He says the numbers suggest it's just not time yet. We still have some ways to go, and incoming data since our last meeting suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. We know the markets do not like uncertainty, right? Because even though they expected today's hike, they don't really like the lack of clarity about what comes next. Remember, the reason why the Fed is hiking rates is to try to get a handle on inflation. We're talking about everything you feel in your monthly budget. Even though we're getting paid more, people's pay is generally up 7.5%. The cost of things you need, that's going up faster. Okay, And with gas prices going up too, again, one Arizona voter told us it just feels stressful. I mean, I do a lot of driving. Um, gas prices are high. I'm seeing a, you know, a decrease in my income just because i got to pay more for, for gas. Now, lest you think it is all doom and gloom here on the news, let me disabuse you of that notion because there is reason for optimism, a big reason when it comes to jobs numbers. There's nearly two openings for every available worker right now. That is a good thing. And with the economy on everybody's mind, President Biden is promising to get costs down. He's announcing $13 billion, rolling that out today, to fight higher energy prices. But you know what his big focus is going to be just about a block from where I'm standing later on tonight? Protecting democracy. But the prime time speech here in Washington just steps from the Capitol in the next couple of hours. We're going to talk about that with Kelly O'Donnell in just a second. But let's get into the economic piece of things with Tom Costello. Because, Tom, it is not unexpected that the Fed hiked rates today. We knew that was going to happen. It seems like what was unexpected was Jay Powell getting up there and saying, like, we're not so sure what's going to happen next year. Yeah, bingo. I mean, the bottom line is three quarters of a point hike that was expected. Uh, and we've ex been expecting another rate hike coming in December. But the markets and the economists out there were generally hoping that Powell today would say we probably can ease off a little bit in December. In other words, instead of another three quarter point rate hike, maybe we do half a point. He wasn't going there. I mean, he essentially said, maybe, maybe not, and leaning towards maybe not. The problem is inflation remains stubbornly high. I mean, we are still at 40-year highs on inflation, despite the fact that the Fed has now raised rates six times this year. And, you know, we've talked about this many times, and I get stopped all the time just in the newsroom. Yeah, this is their only tool, right? They've got a sledgehammer to try to bring down inflation. They don't have a scalpel. All they can do is raise prices to try to make it too expensive for you to go out and buy stuff, and therefore that slows the economy. It hasn't worked yet, and as a result of that, uh, it is likely to see, we're likely to see interest rates moving even higher on credit cards, on adjustable mortgages, on equity lines, everything right. you see there on the screen, uh, because so far this ain't working and the Fed needs to keep trying. Let me channel what I think is probably the question for every person who is watching right now, and it is an unanswerable question, but I'll put it to you, which is, okay, so when is it going to start working? In other words, when will these moves that the Fed is making, when will we see inflation, right, start to come down as an indication that the Fed's actually getting a handle on it? And therefore, the Fed could start, could stop uh, hiking rates. And they essentially said today, we just don't know yet. Uh, we are in uncharted territory, and we heard the same thing from many top Wall Street, you know, bankers and economists saying, maybe next year, maybe at the end of next year, we'll start to see inflation come down. Uh -huh. So far, it is stubbornly high. And, and here's another. So, like, we should be buckling, point. but Tom, like, we should be buckling up for like two years or longer, not yeah. like two months, and definitely not two weeks, right? I mean, just give us the scope of that. It's it's a long. We're, this is like medium, long term haul. Absolutely. And here's the deal. Chairman Powell today said, listen, we would rather tighten too much. In other words, raise rates too much than not enough, because their fear is if they don't really go hard right now trying to stop inflation, it will become entrenched. It will become a part of our fixed economy with inflation running at 8 percent. And that is a killer. So their feeling is we can overdo it. We'd rather raise rates too much and then cut than essentially be behind the eight ball. Tom Costello, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, good to see you yeah. breaking it down for us, as you always do.
Uh, the economy, obviously a big issue, a huge issue for voters right now, right? We know, based on some new polling that is out that we're going to talk about, that a third of voters say that's among the most important issues to them. There's something else that voters say is important, and that's what President Biden's going to be talking about, protecting democracy. He's set to give a speech here in semi-prime time, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, about the potential of violence from election deniers. You're looking at the numbers here, right? You can see, we know that from our NBC News polling, threats to democracy is an issue for people. But look at this, inflation, 36 percent, including, obviously, most Republicans, a majority of Republicans, immigration, abortion, also issues that are affecting people as well. I want to bring in now Kelly O'Donnell, who is tracking and following what President Biden is going to be up to tonight. This is his closing message, Kelly. And what's interesting is I think people might think, well, wait a second, shouldn't the president be in like a battleground, right? Like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arab, pick, pick it. Where does he go? He's going to be, I'm literally looking at Union Station right now. I can see it from where I'm sitting at on set. Blocks from the Capitol. This is very intentional. The White House wants this backdrop near, you, near the Capitol as the president is talking about how he sees the stakes of election night six days away. And the president is honoring one of the rules of politics, and that is to not hold an overtly political event at the White House. In the prior administration, that rule was set aside uh, frequently. Yes. The president is not doing that. He's going to neutral territory in the city and one of the jewels of Washington, D.C., Union Station, right next to the Capitol, to talk about this issue uh, in an unusual time slot. Typically, the president makes remarks during the day. This isn't prime time like a 9 p.m. address, but it is an evening address, and that signifies some of the importance here. And the president will hit the road uh, for more traditional campaigning over the next several days. But this is a message that is about more than just this one set of candidates and issues on the ballot for people around the country. This is something that has a much longer time horizon, and that is talking about important issues of democracy, concerns about election deniers who are, in fact, on the ballot in many places around the country, and how that could affect and change the nature of American politics and democracy, talking about the violence that has now uh, taken uh, really a very vivid example in San Francisco with the uh, life-threatening attack on Paul Pelosi, husband of Speaker Pelosi, on, uh, and, and also the environment of threats made against election workers and the rhetoric that's gotten very hot. So expect the president to talk yeah. about all of these things and what should unify Americans, uh, even if that is not a pocketbook issue. It's one that he hopes will be in people's uh, minds and hearts as they consider uh, what they want to do with their ballots. Kelly? This, I'm going to be honest with you, Kelly. A very annoying thing happened while you were speaking there, which is we got excerpts Did of the excerpts president's come speech. Out? Okay. Yes. Well, you can't look at your phone. I'm sorry. I know that's that's frustrating that you that we that's knew they were speaking. coming. Yes. Yeah. So they're out, right? And I think it speaks to. I mean, you have so capably laid out what you have heard from sources inside the White House here of what the president is going to say. But I want to read one line, Kelly, and I'll give you a moment to look at your phone too, as I'm looking at mine. Um, he says, you know, he points out as he lays out the stakes according to these excerpts that have been released now from the White House. He points out there are candidates running for every level of office in America who won't commit to accepting the results of the election they're in. And President Biden is expected to say tonight, that is the path to chaos in America. He's expected to say, this is no ordinary year, right? Because he says in a typical year, we're not often faced with the question of whether the vote we cast will preserve democracy or put it at risk. This is him laying out the stakes as he sees it. The question is, is he, Kelly, in some ways, preaching to the choir. In other words, are there persuadable voters out there who will hear this from the president, the head of the Democratic Party? Um, because really none of what the president is going to say is anything new if you've been following the news. We know there are election deniers running for office. We know that the White House, the president, and many Democrats have worked to cast this election as a fight to preserve democracy. And it has been an issue that has been uh, much more top of mind for many Democratic voters than Republican voters in some of the surveys that have been done. So these are themes we've heard the president talk about. He will lay this out in very stark terms. The real question will be, will others come along who don't agree with Joe Biden politician when they're hearing from President Biden, leader of the country and of all Americans? That'll be a real question. Kelly O'Donnell live for us on the North Lawn of the White House. Kel, thank you. Appreciate it. So while the current president is said to be at Union Station here, his former boss, former President Obama, he's going to be out on the campaign trail in Arizona 
for the first time since leaving office, part of this cross-country tour that'll take him to Pennsylvania Saturday after a trip to Nevada last night, where his message, honestly, was pretty straightforward. The reason I'm here is simple. I'm here to ask you to vote. Vote. Turn out. It will not shock you. The turnout is going to be the key to these elections, okay? It's going to be his message in Arizona, too, a state that is about as battleground as a battleground can get. Look at this. The race between Senator Mark Kelly and Blake Masters really tightening up over the last month, right? I mean, totally inside the margin of error, basically. You've also got a governor's race there between Kerry Lake, a high-profile election denier on the Republican side, and Democrat Katie Hobbs, also inside the margin of error. Vaughn Hilliard is in his happy place, which is Phoenix, Arizona, uh, a state that he knows better than probably anybody in our building. Um, you, you spoke with Senator Kelly. What's interesting here is who he's deciding to share the stage with and who he is not making a big point to share the stage with. Talk us through it. Right. This is the first time that you are going to see the gubernatorial candidate, Katie Hobbs, appearing on stage with Mark Kelly throughout this entire campaign here. And that's largely because, let's look at the numbers. Republicans have a voter registration advantage by a lot in the state of Arizona, eight, nine percentage points. And that is where you have seen a history of Democrats running in the state very much as these more independent type candidates, because they know they need to win over the not only independents, but some sort of anti-Trump conservatives in order to have any shot at winning this. But then you've got to crack down at to why is former President Obama coming here today, because there's also the reality that Democrats need to turn out Democratic voters in Arizona. They exist, they are important, and they are needed. And that is where it gets at the heart of these two campaigns and the ways that they have operated. Look, Katie Hobbs, uh, you know, over the course of the last year, she has faced some scrutiny when a staffer from the state Senate back when she was in the legislature was fired and a court, a judge found that she needed to be fired on uh, sex discrimination and r racial discrimination uh, uh, positions. And and Katie Hobbs was named in that lawsuit. And that is where you have seen her apologize for that, but also try to position yeah. herself as somebody who wants to rep all of Arizona here, as Mark Kelly also looks to try to uh, coalesce that Democratic support around him in the Democratic slate. We're at the point where it's like, um, you know, the stars are out, if you will, in both parties here. Former President Obama in these final days coming in, trying to get people to turn out. On the other side of the aisle, you have former Vice President Mike Pence. He's down in North Carolina where there's an interesting Senate race there backing uh, candidate Ted Budd. Here's what he had to say. North Carolina is going to do your part to elect a Republican majority in the Senate, a Republican majority in the House of Representatives. We're going to end the speakership of Nancy Pelosi once and for all. And with Ted Budd in Washington. There is a strategy here, Vaughn, as you well know, for where these surrogates mm -hmm. are headed and when. Right. And also Mike Pence, right? Nobody is going to bat an eye that there's a certain part of the constituency who he appeals to. And it's the same situation here like in Arizona with Katie Hobbs, right? Folks, these candidates, Ted Budd, Katie Hobbs, they have had negative campaign advertisements that have been run against them that are hitting at their core constituencies, essentially trying to cut into the inspiration for voters to come out and back them. And that is why you see Mike Pence coming out and trying to bring, especially those more traditional conservatives, those evangelical voters, to come out and support him. And that is why you see Barack Obama here with Katie Hobbs and Mark Kelly. They're trying to bring home those voters who typically vote but may question whether this election Election. This midterm election is one that they want to take part in. They need those voters just as much as they need swing voters in these very highly contested races. Because you're a midterms correspondent tonight, Vaughn, uh, and you're wearing that hat for us around the country, I want to quickly touch on Pennsylvania because what's so interesting to me is, as President Obama, former President Obama goes to Pennsylvania next, is we're now seeing the first poll taken totally after that Senate debate between John Fetterman, the Democrat, Mehmet Oz, the Republican here. And turns out, Vaughn, lo and behold, doesn't seem like it moved the needle all that much. Fetterman's up by about five points, close to the margin of error. Only 3% of people, according to this poll, are reconsidering their support for Fetterman after that debate. Um, not a huge impact, even though, listen, 3%, this is a tight race, that could make a difference. Talk me through it. Right, 3% is, is not significant here. And when you're talking about 
where we are in 2022. It's a conversation that we have every election cycle, Holly. Are, are folks going out and voting based off of one issues, two issues, or are they voting based off of the top of the tickets and sort of the idea of uh, Trumpism, right? Or on the Democratic side, are they voting on uh, in an effort to reject election deniers or individuals who are anti-reproductive rights? You know, these are the questions that we'll have a much better understanding of after this Tuesday. And in the case of John Fetterman, if that polling indicates uh, what is indicated in that polling actually plays out over the next five days, it'll be a statement that voters ultimately were voting on the issues and they were not turned off by any health conditions that he may be facing at this time. Vaughn Hilliard live for us in Arizona covering all of it. I'll see you uh, every day, I'm sure, for the next six days, friend. Thanks. Let's talk about what just happened in the last maybe 20 minutes or so as we were coming on the air. The Parkland shooter officially sentenced to life in prison with no parole for the 2018 massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. The sentencing comes after 48 hours of incredibly emotional statements from the family members of victims. Sam Brock is there. He is covering this developing news from outside the courthouse in Fort Lauderdale. And the judge in this case followed a jury's recommendation here. How are, how are family members feeling about what they might see or might not see as justice? As the judge noted in her initial remarks that she did not dress down the shooter, Hallie, she spoke to the families before rendering that sentencing and said some of the most amazing restraint, grace, strength, and resolve that she had ever seen in her professional career. And the testimony today, I have never seen anything like this, Hallie. In terms of what the families identified, they discussed the institutional failure, the FBI not following up on tips, the school failing to intervene with someone who had hundreds of hours of therapy, and of course now the legal system coming to the conclusion that despite all of the evidence, all of the witness testimony, that the death penalty wasn't warranted here, these parents were beside themselves. Of course, they were deeply upset, but they just wanted to turn the page on this and tell this shooter, you are nothing. We're going to remember our loved ones above mm -hmm. all else, and they read the names of all the victims and their ages. It was so powerful. And just one quick anecdote, Hallie. The father Please. of Scott Beagle said, you fired 139 bullets. At no point, not even after bullet one, two, three, four, or five, did you say, oh my God, I can't believe what I'm doing. You continued to hunt our children in the hallways, went from first floor to second floor to third floor. As they were dying on the ground, you shot them again. These parents relayed the pain that they have experienced over the course of the last four plus years. And there are no words to do that justice. What you are talking about is so critical, Sam, because it centers the lives lost, right? And we talk about that a lot on the show, centering the victims of horrific acts of mass violence like this. This has been, as you point out, years in the making. Um, this, And, and I, I do hesitate to call it justice, Sam, because I don't think the families are calling it justice. It's not closure. It's not justice. Maybe it is accountability here at this point. It is, and there's a feeling that there is a complete lack of accountability in the sense mm -hmm. that in the state of Florida, the laws were changed as of 2017. If this happened in 2016, this verdict would have been capital punishment. But the Supreme Court struck down a portion of that law in 2017. They reconfigured it from a simple majority to unanimous consent. That did not happen. I want to play one quick soundbite for you of Mr. Gutenberg, the father of Jamie Gutenberg, in court today, describing seeing the video for the first time of his daughter being murdered. Here's what he said. I watched you kill my daughter on video. And unfortunately, I saw you killing many of the others as well. I saw you enjoying it. And I saw also what I expected of my daughter, who was the toughest human being on the face of the earth, running for her life down the hallway. And the thing is, my daughter made it to within one second of being alive. She actually made it into the stairwell. You shot her with a single shot. You severed her spinal cord, her chest filled with blood in the stairwell. You did that. You did that to the other 16 as well. It was Fred Gutenberg's wife, Jennifer, who said to the shooter, how dare you wear your mask this entire time? How disrespectful to the families. And believe it or not, Hallie, he took down his mask. And from that point onward, we listened to all these family members pour out their hearts, and you would cut away to him. Nothing. No facial expression, no anything. And when they got up after the verdict, after the sentencing, I should say, was read, he walked away. It looked like he might have been wiping his tears for a second. He was just putting that mask back on. And that was the end of the hearing today. But no semblance of emotion on anything as he was dressed down all afternoon. And he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Sam Brock, I'm glad you're there for us. Thank you for bringing that to us.
We got some more breaking news, this time into us from New York, where the state's attorney general says she's secured more than $30 million from CBS and its former chairman for insider training. Les Moonves, the former C uh, chairman from CBS, stepped down in 2018, remember, after a number of allegations of sexual harassment and sexual assault. The AG's office says it has evidence that a captain for the LAPD knew about a sexual harassment complaint and worked with CBS executives to keep it quiet, to stop it from becoming public. The filing shows a text from the captain to one executive the day that Moonves resigned, saying, quote, we worked so hard to try to avoid this day. I am so completely sad. Tom Winter has this story for us. What else do we know about how this went down? Reaction here from CBS, statements from Moonves, et cetera. What's up? So, Hallie, this investigation all started out with a potential violation of New York's Martin Act. Basically, they have to disclose, as a publicly traded company, certain things to its investors, certain things to the general public. And one of the things they didn't disclose is the fact that Moonves was facing this criminal investigation from the LAPD that you referenced, uh, another woman's allegations, uh, as well as other uh, allegations that have been brought forward, including reports by reporters, and that they didn't say that in their SEC filings. That launched this investigation investigation, which then unearthed this whole LAPD issue. We've reached out to the LAPD for comment. They said they weren't aware of this uh, prior to us reaching out to them, prior to these law, uh, to these court papers being dropped, rather, Hallie. And so what they found out is that this LAPD captain in the Hollywood division was part of Moonves's paid detail for security at various award shows. Uh, and so essentially, in the course of their investigation, they determined that as soon as this woman filed these allegations that stem from the 1980s and prior to Moonves's employment at CBS, uh, that he alerted CV CBS that they were reported. He alerted CBS to the victim's name, which is in complete violation of every law and regulation for law enforcement, and then proceeded to have somebody admonish the victim not to go to the press because it might damage the investigation. And there's numerous uh, back and forth between the LAPD captain and CBS, uh, CBS paying $28 million, two and a half to Les Moonves, uh, and also another CBS executive apparently was given permission to sell their shares. He was head of communications at the time and personally benefited uh, from selling the shares before an 11 percent, approximately 11 percent stock drop. Now, CBS has not yet issued a statement, uh, but this was a settlement today between the two parties, and we haven't heard from Les Moonves either, but it's clear that there was quite an effort here, according to the New York Attorney General, to make sure that these charges, uh, or at least this criminal complaint, stayed quiet for a long time in the middle of fierce reporting. And, of course, all this going on, Hallie, as you referenced, during the height of Me Too. That's right, in the thick of the Me Too movement. Tom Winter, thank you. To the latest out west now on the attack against the Speaker of the House's husband, Paul Pelosi, with today, just this afternoon, actually, tonight, a top House Democrat sending a letter to the U.S. Capitol Police Chief raising new questions about security protections for members of Congress generally after this attack. The Capitol Police also now confirming that there was a live camera feed outside of the Pelosi's home in San Francisco during the attack, but nobody was watching it, according to a couple of sources familiar with that situation. I want to bring in Aaron McLaughlin now. A couple of new buckets here, Aaron. Um, let me take sort of bucket number one, which is this letter now from Zoe Lofgren, who is a Democratic member of Congress. She sits on the January 6th Select Committee, and she is, has some concerns as she is now raising to the head of Capitol Police about generally protections for members of Congress and their families at this moment of intense um, polarization and the threat of violence against people who serve in office. Yeah, and it appears, Hallie, that those concerns are now being heard by Capitol Hill Police. Just a short while ago, they released a statement. Let me just read you part of what they had to say about those security concerns. The department has begun an internal security review and we'll be gathering input and questions from our congressional stakeholders. We have been immensely grateful for the critical support that Congress already provided to secure the U.S. Capitol complex after January 6, 2021. The funding was vital for us to implement dozens of immediate improvements. Now we will fast track the work we have already been doing to enhance the protection of members outside of Washington, D.C., while also providing new protective options that will address concerns following Friday's 
targeted attack. No word on the specifics of those new protective options that they are now considering over there at Capitol Police. This statement also acknowledging that there was a video feed from Nancy Pelosi's home just behind me that was feeding live footage throughout the attack into the Capitol complex. What was happening on that feed was only noticed after San Francisco police arrived at the scene. And from there, a Capitol Hill comp, uh, Capitol Hill police say they facilitated with the investigation with that footage. And there are some important context there, too, because there are something like 1,800 cameras at the Capitol and around the country. Um, one source telling our team that she is the mission, right, meeting Speaker Pelosi. She was not there. Uh, so I think there is this sense coming from sort of that side of things, the police side of things, that, like, the expectation cannot be to monitor every single camera 24-7 when the protectee is not even at the home. Yeah, she was the mission, uh, according to uh, uh, sources there, speaking to my colleague Garrett Haig, but it appears, according to the statement from the Capitol Hill Police, that that mission is changing in light of the nature of Friday's attack, which a uh, prosecutor here in San Francisco alleges was politically motivated. In fact, according to a memo submitted to the court by the prosecution, providing really chilling details about the attack itself, what the suspect had to say inside of the House, and, and making it clear that he was not only targeting the Speaker of the House, but he also was naming other prominent uh, lawmakers, right. federal and local officials, as well as the name of a professor. So it wasn't just Nancy Pelosi that he was looking at. Aaron McLaughlin live for us in San Francisco. Aaron, thank you. Today, back here in D.C., we're learning that the Washington football team, the Commanders, may be up for sale. And after years of controversy, you got a lot of folks saying, well, it's about time. Owner Dan Snyder hiring Bank of America to explore, I'm quoting here, explore potential transactions. Emphasis on the word potential, because nothing's a done deal here yet. The Snyders say they remain committed to the team, its employees, its countless fans. And a person familiar says Snyder is being forced to sell. For years, there's been a lot of public pressure to get him out. Why? Well, right now, he and his team are being investigated by Congress, okay, by the House Oversight Committee and the NFL, after a league investigation found their workplace culture was not professional, especially for women with former employees claiming they were sexually harassed, verbally harassed while working there. Snyder has denied any wrongdoing. Alex Sherman is joining us now. Okay, Alex, so let me tell you, like, what the most high-interest story is where I live in Washington. Like, it's, it's a lot of this, because the Snyders, Dan Snyder, very controversial figure here. I know the commander has said they, like, are definitely not going to sell the team. They haven't said either way definitively here, but hiring a big bank seems like a very clear indication of which way they're headed. A hundred percent agree, Hallie. When when you hire a bank like Bank of America to explore options, that means you're serious. I mean, that, yeah. that was that's that's always been my own personal reporting standard in terms of when to know when to report if a general acquisition uh, is, is is for real or not. So this is for real. Um, so if you are a Washington Commanders fan and you've been waiting for the day for Daniel Snyder to sell the team, uh, this is certainly. A pivotal day, as you said, no deal yet, uh, but the team is valued by Forbes at $5.6 billion. If he does go ahead and find a buyer, I'm told he could find a price as high as $7 billion. That would wow. blow away the old record for any sports franchise uh, sold in terms of overall valuation. Uh, the, the highest previous one was the recent sale of the Denver Broncos at $4.65 billion. Who would be a buyer? And if this deal happens, Alex, I mean, Snyder is, is now then, like, would have no involvement with the team, right? Like, it would be kind of a cleaning of the house kind of situation? Absolutely. I mean, I, you have to think that's what's motivating this. Uh, uh, certainly, there are various degrees of what being forced to sell the team means. The league didn't put out a statement or anything saying uh, he's been forced. But anyone who's been following the Daniel Snyder situation uh, is certainly familiar with the various different misconducts, uh, allegations, and investigations that you mentioned Prior to that, Indianapolis owner Jim Irsay came out recently and said, look, we may have to think about removing him as an owner. So there's a lot of pressure for yeah. him to sell. You'd have to imagine, you know, get out your Rolodex of wealthy individuals in terms of someone to buy it, because $7 billion 
is a huge price tag. Um, so, you know, look, I, at this point, it's pure speculation. Certainly the one around the office people are talking about is, would Jeff Bezos make a bid? He owns the Washington Post. He's very close with Commissioner Roger Goodell. He likes football a lot. Amazon owns the Thursday night package. You never know. Alex Sherman, I imagine we are going to be talking more about this in the days and the weeks to come. It's good to see you. Thanks. Still ahead, don't call it a comeback. Wait, or maybe do, because it looks like Benjamin Netanyahu might become Israel's prime minister again. Plus, could there be a pilot strike right around the corner? What? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you're traveling for the holidays, okay? But we got to talk about it because it could mess up your plans. We'll get to, we'll get into it in the five things in just a sec. NBC News elections exclusive to bring you now ahead of the midterms because sources are telling us that there's a hundred state and local municipalities, right, that have reached out to the federal government and they're saying, hey, we want help. We want to make sure that our networks are safe from hackers. Well, guess what? They're on a waiting list here, six days out from Election Day because of a major backlog. Listen, right, context. The vast majority of voting machines are not connected to the Internet, OK? But there's still a lot of digital information out there that could be vulnerable, like voter registration, details on how and where to vote, email systems, et cetera. Let me bring in now Julia Ainsley, who scooped this story for our team here at NBC News. It's great reporting, Julia. And help us understand it, right? You've got these all these dozens of these state and local jurisdictions, basically, that are like, hey, CISA, which is the federal cyber like, hey, CISA, help us. And CISA's like, we're... What is it? We're too busy? Like, we, we have too much on our plate? What's I mean, up? What we understand is that there's a significant staffing shortage at CISA. If you have to think they're trying to compete with Silicon Valley to be able to hire these tech experts who essentially, in this case, want a government to, salary, by the way, yeah. not a Silicon Valley exactly. salary. Right. But their job essentially is to go in and see if they can hack into these websites, if they can pull voter registrations, if they could change the numbers that are projected on election night. It's, it's like a stress test. Right. It's a stress test and using very similar tactics to what we know Russia used. And 2016. The Mueller report detailed those tactics. It might also include sending a phishing email to an employee. See if they click on it, open it. Are you secure enough to put off all of those threats? Well, as it turns out, more than 100 of these jurisdictions haven't gotten the help they've asked for. And why this is really significant is because CISA has been telling us and everyone in the media that, look, what we offer is really voluntary. We can't go in. The states have to come to us. That's the line we keep hearing, but that they offer all of these services. But now we're learning it's actually very much the other way around, that states are asking for States the are taking them up on the offer. And, and they're they not can't. able to get it. Yeah. So that's what really is coming to light for us. I do think that people should feel secure about their vote, that their individual vote wouldn't be tampered with. But we should be looking at what our federal government is doing versus what they're saying and how they can protect things like someone getting deleted from a voter registration roll. These are all really critical things, not only to ensure that people feel good about their election, but that there isn't a lot of chaos and confusion that could be sowed on the back end. These stress tests take weeks, right? So there's Much no chance sometimes. they're going to get done before election day. Like, it's exactly. not like 30 of these jurisdictions can get I mean, CISA is election. not denying this to us. Yeah. They um, say that these kind of things can take months, and so a backlog is not likely to be taken care of by Tuesday. Um, but they do say that they have been able to provide what they call a cyber hygiene test that's just sort of best practices, and that over 400 jurisdictions have taken them up on that, and they have at least passed those tests, although not these extensive ones that they've been asking for. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. To bring Thanks, Hallie. I know folks are going to be reading that scoop on our website. Appreciate it. Thank you. So before you wrap up your day, maybe with a little happy hour, it is that time after all. You may want to hear some new data on the potential alcohol risks that are being revealed. It's an interesting one. Stay with us. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local out of our Midwest Bureau. Prosecutors believe two Iowa teenagers killed their Spanish teacher last year over a bad grade, according to court documents. Today, you had a judge hearing arguments on whether to exclude any evidence against teens from trial. Both of them were 16 at the time of the murder. They're now 17, and they've been charged as adults. From our West Coast Bureau, a Stanford University official says some guy pretended to be a student and lived in school dorms for at least 10 months. That person said the school has been trying to get rid of him since last December, but they couldn't actually find him until last week. Stanford says it's going to review its procedures to stop something like this from ever happening again. The student newspaper there reported this man had been living in a dorm's basement when they found him. Out of our Southeast Bureau, really bad drought has exposed an entire, look at this, 
That's a casino riverboat that had sunk in the Mississippi River near Memphis. It's called the Diamond Lady. This boat only sank about a year ago. But as the drought has obviously dried up all the water, like, look what has come back to land. It's this boat, totally exposed. That's a visual that really tells the story. So listen, something to think about um, as you are thinking about maybe having a sober, curious Christmas or a holiday where you're cutting back on the amount of alcohol you're drinking. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you're thinking the opposite. Whatever your thought process is on alcohol, there's this new study that is out today that shows too much drinking was the cause of one in five deaths of adults under the age of 49, so 20 to 49. Researchers were looking at this info from about a four-year period between 2015 to 2019. And they found that deaths caused only by alcohol, right? Liver disease, alcohol poisoning, for example. Those deaths have spiked in the past decade. And too much drinking can contribute to other leading causes of death, too. Heart disease, cancer, what is called by doctors like, quote, unintentional injury, right? When you hurt yourself and didn't mean to. Dr. Akshay Sayal joins me now. Dr. Sayal, um, you know, this, this new data basically shows that, that Alcohol is a leading cause of preventable death for people of a certain age, younger than you might think, right, under the age of 49. Does the, do these new numbers surprise you? And how should we be thinking about them um, if, if, if you are, for example, a social drinker? Yeah, good evening, Hallie. You know, these numbers, whether or not they surprise me, it's, it's kind of complicated. You know, we, we've known about the dangers of alcohol for a while, and I think where the surprise really comes in is how big of an issue this is. I mean, you had the number there, one in five adults under the age of 49. Um, but when you really think about it, I mean, alcohol is everywhere in our culture, from, from shirts like Mommy Wine Time or, you know, wine is cheaper than therapy, yeah. to, to turning on the TV and seeing wine, in, you know, in morning news shows. So, yes, this, you know, it's not too surprising, but I think just the magnitude of the one in five really, really did take me aback. But, but how much alcohol is too much alcohol? Or let me put it the inverse way, which is, is any amount of alcohol okay? Yes. Yeah, so traditionally, you know, if you look at the CDC, what they say is moderate drinking is, you know, what they recommend is OK. And, you know, that's one drink or less a day for women and two for men. And, you know, to clarify, a drink is a 12 ounce beer of five ounces of wine or an ounce and a half of, you know, whiskey, vodka or gin. Um, but, you know, more, more and more research is starting to show that even low amounts of alcohol can lead to things of, you know, increased risk of cancer. So, you know, I, I realize if, if I were to come up here and say, you know, don't drink at all, nobody yeah, like would really listen feels, to me. That feels kind of, <laughs> can I be honest, like that feels not realistic, right? Because like that just, to, to adults who might enjoy a glass of wine, who would not identify themselves as having what, what you might think of like a, an issue with alcohol, for example, which is something that exists. And there are plenty of people who are getting help for, for a, being unable to not abuse alcohol let's say. Um, I don't know that, that a doctor saying to somebody, don't drink at all ever, is like going to be the, the smart solve here, right? No, I, I agree with you. You have to meet people where they're at. And, you know, I enjoy a glass of wine myself as well. So, you know, the best advice I can give is really try to stick to it in moderation. Those two drinks or less per day for men yeah. and one for women as best you can. And it's not, you know, it's not a prescription to drink every day. It's when you are going to drink, just try to keep it to that number. Uh, Dr. Akshay Sial, thank you so much for bringing that to us. Appreciate Anytime. it. So to come here on the show, somebody that I know you will be paying attention to during midterms next week. This guy, Steve Kornacki. Our backstory gives you a behind the scenes look at what it's actually like to be Steve in the week before an election. Like I know Steve and I learned something tonight. So stand by. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And news junkies and politics junkies, you're gonna be psyched for this one because we're spotlighting an NBC VIP who has one of the biggest jobs here at the network on election night. You know him, you love him, you love his khakis, Steve Kornacki, right, who brings us through all the returns, does a ton of memorization in order to help us understand what is going down on election night or election week. He is so popular that a few years ago they instituted the Kornacki cam. It is just, it is just all Steve all the time. That's my nightmare, but Steve crushes it, okay? He's so good at analyzing numbers that our friends over at NBC Sports have actually borrowed him to break down data for the Super Bowl, for the Triple Crown, for even the Olympics. Joining me now is one of the best human beings to ever step foot into 30 Rockefeller Plaza, and that is Steve Kornacki. Hi, friend. It's good to see you. Hallie, it's great to see you, too. So let me start off. We are, we are six days out from election night. Like, you're ready? What are you doing? What's your plan? Like, do you have binders and binders of information? Like, what, what's up? Give us the behind-the-scenes look at what you're doing now less than a week out. 
What was what was the old uh, Mike Tyson line? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I got a plan, and I imagine by 7:30 p.m. it'll all be you know obliterated. Um, I, I try to go into election night just um, aware of as many possibilities as possible. And, and what that generally I think means is it, mean, it obviously means over preparing because it means trying to memorize a lot of stuff, commit a lot of stuff to memory, totally. numbers, maps, things like that. 95% of which will never get mentioned on air. But in the event that a particular race ends up being particularly consequential or close or meaningful, I need to be ready to, you know, kind of go deep on it. So the only way to do that is just to prepare for as many contingencies as you can. Uh, what's your technique? Because, like, I'm prepping, right? And I'm like, I'm like a briefing book person. So we're doing books and I'm doing docs and all that. Are you like a flashcard guy? Do you have a photographic memory? Like, how do you do it all? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Folks of a, of a certain age might, might remember something called the Baltimore Catechism, where it's just a lot of memorization and, and committing. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of the same thing, you know, for me. It's just um, look at a map, go through the counties. What was the 2020 result? For me this year, what was the 2020 result? Right. What was the 2016 result? What are the major features of this county in terms of is there a particular city? Is there a particular area of interest? Is there a particular piece of, uh, uh, of political or cultural yeah. significance to be aware of? And, and just, you know, have context really for every county, every district that, uh, that could come into play and just, just memorize as much of it as you can. We've talked a lot here on this show, um, like on all the shows that, that we do, about this is election night, but it really might be election week, right? Because it is entirely possible that we don't call the balance of power in, let's say, the Senate um, on actual Tuesday night. What is, what is, like, your secret? What's a thing that people might be surprised to hear that you do or that you're going to have with you on election night or election week besides, you know, a jug of Red Bull or whatever? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, my secret weapon is my producer, Adam Naboa. I uh, knew you were going to say Adam. I knew know, it. He's, he's <laughs> not, not too far from this camera shot right Adam, now. Adam, come and say hi. Adam, if you'd like, no pressure. They're, they're asking if you want to say hello. Adam's, you know. All right, he's doing his thing. There he is. Hey, uh, ladies and yes. gentlemen, Adam, if you hear me saying Adam, on election night, it'll always be, it's like Jeopardy. It's in the form of a question. I'm asking Adam something, and that's who I am. That's who I'm I talking to. What about, let me ask you about your khakis, but only because I have to. We were talking before the segment because there was this awesome Washington Post profile of you in your very messy office, no disrespect intended. I know big the, the bigger the brain, the messier the office. But the comments, people either love your khakis or hate them. What, what's up with that? Like, you're just wearing them because they're comfortable, right? Like, it's easy. I, I never meant for it to be a thing. I'm still baffled by the reaction I got in 20. I, they happen to be what I, it's not like I have this lifelong, I'm always going to wear khakis. This is, I, I really had no huge attachment to it as a, a style of clothing. I just had them on that week during the election in 2020, and then it became a thing. And now everybody expects me to wear them all yeah. the time, but I, I, I can wear other pants. I'm happy to. Okay. <laughs> hey, before we let you go, we're out of time. What's the one thing we should be thinking about on election night? In other words, what's the one Kornacki thing that you're going to be watching that we should be thinking about that viewers might not be thinking about right now? I just Virginia, because 7 p.m. is one of the earliest poll closing times, and there are three house races in Virginia that I think, for different reasons, can give us a guidepost to how the night's going to go. So I think a lot of Virginia early. Steve Kornacki, appreciate you. Thank you. Good luck next week. Can't wait to see you in the building. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Hallie. If you cannot get enough of Steve Kornacki, and I know you can't, check out his new original podcast, The Revolution, talking all things partisan politics. Scan the QR code on your screen now or just pull it up wherever you get your podcasts. That does it for us this hour. It's good to be with you. More tomorrow, same time, same place. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.